Hi guys, hi everybody. Um, this is Apple Treats and uh, this is 18th episode of our podcast. We are getting closer to 20 at least, <laughs> hopefully to make uh, more, but we'll see. And uh, today we have Vladimir as my co-host and we have Alex Gribenyuk, who is our guest today. Hi guys. Hello, everyone. Yeah, we will be talking uh, about the open source activities, pet projects, and uh, like everything uh, development related, and uh, more specifically, probably indie development. Um, I think uh, we can start. Uh, but okay, we, let's let's not talk about open source. It's 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 a very obvious topic. Let's talk about yes. you, Max. Come on, guys. What do you think about this? Alexander, obviously, what's your opinion? Obvious. Let's go with it. Yeah. No, I'm overjoyed. I think Apple, they finally delivered everything that the users asked for and more, right? Like, I didn't expect promotion. It's a nice addition or even an OLED display. Yeah, but still no USB port. So, oh, well. <laughs> um, yeah, but just, not... you know, just watching the key. Yeah, and it's, well, I can leave with that. It's fine. I'm used to it. I have it on my iPhone. It's fine. It's like Apple. Apple is equivalent to Notch now. Right. Yeah, but just you know, just what you know. For me, it was like an, an emotional experience, which is rarely the case now, because I felt like all like you know all the frustrations from the last five years. I have a, one of these 2016. Well, I made a two, 2018 model. It, it's really frustrating. <laughs> I just went through repairs myself. Uh, the keyboard wasn't in. I tried to move off my USB-C ports. <laughs> it, it's really bad. Yeah. But fortunately, it's behind us, right? And for me, right. I think the main highlight is the small 14-inch, which can now be as powerful as 15-inch. That's the machine that I always wanted. And you can even configure it with a the line and one and and one Mac. X, oh my God, that's possible. With 32 CPU, GPU cores, we'd say, right? Yeah, I think that's the machine that truly got unleashed. <laughs> yeah, it's, I think it's almost a ridiculous update from 13 inch. And Apple didn't even bother comparing it with the four cores, right? They just went straight for, we're comparing like best of the best, top of the line, eight core Intel machine. Yeah, but they also didn't compare it with MacBook Pro 13 inch with M1. Uh, for that matter, I think that would have been an interesting comparison for some people, right? If they're deciding between, do I need to get 13 inch or maybe the new 14 inch? What's the difference? We don't know, right? Yeah, and uh, it th this Mac is uh, it's something I would like to have now. I mean, like when we uh, watched the first Macs announced on M1, that was like, uh, we saw that this is entry level machines actually, even like, for, uh, 13 inch uh, MacBook Pro, it was called Pro, but it was like, w yeah, it was entry level. Now we Very have like yeah. normal machines <laughs> for, for the rest of us, for the developers, for the creators and uh, everybody. And uh, these are like, I think these are some something which will stay for, for longer. The only Mac I still miss probably is bigger iMac, which uh, should be great. Probably again. <laughs> okay, um, we will probably not be covering the whole event and the whole specs of all chips and everything. Uh, let's uh, let's focus on the development. And um, uh, Alex, uh, people know you as an author of uh, several tools and uh, uh, several interesting open source projects. Uh, but let's start with your path into development. So, how did you start developing apps? How did you entered the iOS and macOS and like all Apple uh, related developments? Yeah, um, well, I, actually, I studied in information security, but I never really liked it. I always wanted to uh, build software for the users, right? I didn't want to mess with cryptography and protocols and all that. <laughs> so I, you can say that I'm mostly just a self-taught engineer. Um, uh, 
Uh, but just having a degree also helped with relocation. So it's nice to have. If you're considering <laughs> getting a degree, just get one. Uh, you'll need, might need it later. Uh, and I started in a small outsourcing app development studio in Moscow. I wasn't getting paid much, but uh, I think the main advantage was that I was immediately given a ton of responsibilities. So I had like to design a, an app from scratch. I didn't have to modify an existing app that used OpenGL, ES, and had a ton of C code. I also had to make some changes on the server side with C Sharp. So, and I also had a senior engineer to mentor me while, while I was doing it. So that, I think that was a perfect environment for grow, growth and I'm very grateful for it. I think it can be different in a, if you join a large company here, they'll only allow you like to change the button color and that's it for a year or write a unit test, right? <laughs> that's all your responsibilities. True. And yeah, by the way, before we like move on, uh, everybody who are watching us live, uh, feel free to uh, ask questions. We will uh, address them to Alex or maybe we will discuss them all together. Just, uh, yeah, feel free to uh, ask anything you want. And uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's move on. Yeah, so before I found you in uh, history of uh, commits on my current project, uh, <laughs> first I found you on GitHub with your open source uh, libraries. Uh, first, I, pro I don't remember how it's called with uh, image caching, loading and caching, how it was called. Uh, yeah, DF image manager, probably that one. Yeah, probably that one. Uh, so how did you start doing this? How did you start publishing your, your own code to everyone? Um, well, I created my first open source project uh, about eight years ago in 2013. It's a long time ago, so I don't even remember what my motivation was at the time. Uh, but and I remember that, that there were, weren't nearly as many open source projects available as there are now, right? So I was just, I was just motivated to solve the problem that I had to work like that uh, for this project it was df cache so it was like a caching layer right so this cache memory cache uh, we also had access to the file made metadata which is cool it was quite unique um and i just wanted to share my solutions with others because i just thought it was cool <laughs> and then i just couldn't stop really i just do it because i like it and i think it's fun really um i'm i'm also i'm fascinated that open source even exists as a concept. Just why would anyone like build a solution and just make it available for everyone for free, right? <laughs> why would anyone do that? Uh, well, it turns out a lot of people do. You have tons of projects in Swift, which are all open, the community is working on it, et cetera, right? Uh, and also think that for big projects, open source kind of makes more sense even because you actually often get a community of people who are invested in it, like who contribute back to into it. In my experience, unfortunately, that's not always the case on a smaller projects. So you just release it, people use it. They often like, if they have a problem, they often just fork it. I've done that before. You fork <laughs> it, you fix your issue, and you never bother to contribute it back. <laughs> I think that's like the, the disadvantage. You expect people, oh yeah, I'll release my tool and people will fix issues in it and help me develop it. Uh, not necessarily the case in reality, right? But I think open source is still like, it's primarily a tool for me. It's like learning and like professional growth. That That's what I use it for. How often do you use your own open source projects <laughs> in, in your project, your personal projects or your yeah. work projects? Uh, actually, interestingly, in some of my previous projects, I, I haven't used any of my tools. <laughs> Which is weird because usually people, I think usually people, you know, they build something at work and then they open source it, right? That's how it usually works. But some of my tools, I, I, I never even use them myself in my projects. Uh, I used Nuke in one, in a few projects and I use Pulse, which is my most recent pro project. I use it now at work. So that's that I do use. And looking into your so basically, yeah, you're you're contributing to open source, publishing your projects, and uh, if you look into history of Nuke, it's uh, it's ninth release or it's uh, even like did, yeah, it's did it pass? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, it's ten already. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So it's like basically it's a, it's a lot of work, and 
uh, probably a lot of experience for you personally. So can you share something like what did you learn from the contribution to open source? Like what are the main main outcomes from, from that? Like besides like the, the fact that most people will just use and not contribute back. <laughs> yeah, that's a bummer. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> no, that I'm in it now because uh, when people started using Nuke more and more and FOSS as well, now people are contributing back, right? So I'm fortunate. Like there are quite a few, I'm very grateful for all of the contributions, even if you just report an issue or even if, if you fix an issue, even better, right? But to the very least, report issues, that really helps because some people just, I guess, don't. Yeah, uh, what I learned, what I learned is, what I also learned is how to deal with million different Excel cartage, Cocoa Pods, and SPM issues with frameworks, <laughs> because man, frameworks are such a pain in the ass. Uh, yeah. And I don't know, I think I just working on the projects on the frameworks, it's like, it's a very different experience that's solving a specific problem for your app, because it requires you to think more about the design API feature design, right? You need to document it. You also need to make sure it doesn't regress like for like hundreds or thousands of users. And, um, you know, if you're solving the problem for your app, it often just needs to work in one platform, right? Yeah, it's always iOS, right? Like, who are we kidding? <laughs> Everyone's working on iOS. <laughs> uh, yeah, and only in one Xcode version, right? And only in limited set cases. Uh, but like a framework like Nuke, it supports all Apple platforms. The users like install it differently. They use different Xcode versions and they use APIs in completely different ways, which is like, it's a massive challenge. You generally don't need to think about it when working on like a specific problem. Yeah, and also, you know, just working on a project, I think it's just the best way to learn something when you apply it immediately, right? And with your projects, we're, we're not all fortunate work on like super like exciting, innovative projects. Sometimes it's just some, you know, just some, add some UIs like table views and could change the model. And yeah, here- Display you JSON get... on the screen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what we do, right? And then re not reverse the binary tree, right? Sometimes. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With, but with your own projects, you get to decide what to build and what technologies to use it. So for example, for working on Pulse, like a login framework, login tool, I learned like Swift UI, watch what has TVOS. It was the first time I built a Mac OS app. I learned network framework. I created a document format with a document and a document-based app. These are things that I've never done before. So, you know, and just pick wherever you want and I challenge yourself to do it. And it is just the best way to learn something. That's really cool. So uh, how do you think, like, how many other projects using your open source projects? Have you tried to find information about this? Uh, yeah, there is. There's actually a tool um, on CocoaPods. You can see, like, what apps use your frameworks. So, so yeah, naturally, I'm curious. <laughs> Uh, so I found a few, like just to name a few, there's a Clubhouse, CNN, Hulu, Walgreens, Wayfair, Trivago, Adidas. There, that's just, just to name a few. So there are plenty of like, like be really big apps that use it. That's pretty amazing. But also I know that like when I push a new build, it can, I'm working alone on it. Like nobody's reviewing it. I can potentially break all of these apps. <laughs> so no pressure at all, right? <laughs> That's why we should yeah, follow it takes, somewhere. It, it, it takes a lot of time just to make sure you get everything right. And, you know, people are not disappointed. True. And uh, uh, maybe you have some stories or like, uh, like, I don't know, insights from the past. Were, were there any case when you like were close to breaking something or like, like I don't know, catched an error in, the, in just before publishing or something like that? Oh yeah, no, I catch errors all the time. Yeah, you change something and you break something, but I have a massive like unit test suit with uh, it has twice as much lines of code as the framework itself. And it runs on different Xcode versions and uh, all the platforms. So 
I ever release it catches some issue somewhere. <laughs> that's, that's like must have, I think. And actually what you're saying right now is something which we probably need to like put in a big poster, like unit tests help, <laughs> just do them. Like <laughs> this is something which is uh, oftenly uh, dismissed as something like who needs tests anyway? Like this is something I yeah. hear a lot and uh, yeah, so everybody who is listening now please listen to not just to, to me like but for the guys who are re really doing important projects which are used like, in big apps like tests help <laughs> um, yeah if you're writing a banking app maybe test it a little bit <laughs> <laughs> true <laughs> okay um i have one more question here and um like you're not doing just the open source you have other projects as well which are like <laughs> we, we need to describe them somehow but before we will go into that how do you find time for that i mean you have full-time job right and uh, you have these yep. indie or pet or i don't know like hobby projects or are they more than hobby like how do you time manage for yourself yeah i actually i always like my main focus is always on my projects at work and um uh for open source oh i'm just leave a lead a truly unhealthy lifestyle <laughs> that i don't <laughs> recommend to anyone uh for example just you know working on pulse i i sometimes i start at 8 a.m on saturday and then i finish coding at 11 p.m. at night. Uh, I don't think that's how most people want to spend their free time. Uh, I don't really recommend this to anyone, but don't maybe, repeat maybe, this maybe yourself only in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> at your own risk, like, maybe at the beginning of your career, though, right? You have you generally have the time. So it's good to invest it early and then just reap the benefits. True. True. Yeah, I think I have one more question related to this. Uh, so I saw that uh, on GitHub you you have enabled uh, you have sponsors feature. So yeah. does this motivate you to continue your work? Or it's just a funny thing. Oh yeah, it actually does. I was considering like completely uh, stopping doing open source about two years ago just as with github sponsors was announced at the time right i was one of the early uh i joined very early uh and it really is a like significant uh mo motivating factor for me now um now i'm very fortunate to have so many people who contribute and sponsor uh it's not significant right and um but, but it's also not something that many projects can really rely on because if you want to earn money, I think if that's your motivation. You just really need to build a commercial, wherever, like an app or a tool, just make a commercial, be straight about it. Like, uh, but for GitHub sponsors, it's just a little bit of a bonus, right? It's really nice to know that people appreciate it and, um, uh, it's the best sort of thank you, right? It doesn't need to be much, uh, but it's really, really nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, if, if someone's code uh, helps you to save, I don't know, a couple of days or a couple of weeks of work, just guys, do this. Uh, even a couple of bucks a month will help someone mm -hmm. to continue doing this. Just do this. You earn a lot of money, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah. I, I have one question here be before we move on just a sec um, so there is probably again like you said there is a uh, there is a way when you need to uh, just make a commercial product uh, project and uh, well github sponsors let's let's face it this is only for the projects which are relevant for the developers like no normal user will be a, a github sponsor for like consumer yeah, facing okay. app but uh okay. where is the balance when you need to create a like full featured commercial tool for the developers or 
create a tool for the developers with the support of GitHub sponsors. Do you see some line there or like where, will you some, uh, at some time in the future like basically do something as a commercial app rather than app available to the sponsors? Like, do you, What do you think about mm -hmm. that? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I'm thinking about it. I think uh, developers, you know, how else would you really um, commercialize a framework, right? Like, especially if it's something small. I think really the only way to go is sponsors and just hope that people do sponsor. Again, just don't rely, you can't rely really on to earn much on it. Um, going for, but also what worked for me personally is uh like sponsorware it's a, there's a little bit of gray area here so sponsorware um is um you know you give something for free and open source but then some part of functionality is uh you know only for sponsors or like temporarily it's only for sponsors until it reaches a certain number of sponsors and then it becomes free for everyone that's how i made polls and that's how i'm the working on Pulse Pro. It's the same thing. Like you can get it as a sort of a bonus, right? Because often sponsors give some sort of bonus content. It can be like videos or direct access, or you can put a logo on your repo. There is always some kind of like arrangement, right? Um, I think for most people, they like to get something when they sponsor, right? So you gotta think yeah. about just something extra. And okay, uh, we... for, but for commercial, yeah, for, yeah, sorry, just, just finish and answering the question. Like for, okay. for commercial app, I think it's, it's a very different story. You have to, I just feel that there's more responsibility. Uh, uh, you also got to think about like doing it in my own company or what would I do, uh, how to distribute it, like all of this stuff. I'm not, I don't think I am personally ready now uh, to commit to like fully commercial app with like privacy policy, like support channel and all that. <laughs> yeah, and, the, and everything else. And like, you will probably will need to deal with accounting and everything like much more than with the sponsorship. Yeah. Um, we have a question. <laughs> and uh, the question right. is uh, from Maxim, uh, and the question basically targets the quality of Apple products, uh, specifically iOS uh, SDKs. Like, do you think quality is degrading, or uh, like, w what's your opinion on that? I think it's always been pretty terrible. <laughs> so <laughs> there are always things, there are always bad things, and. Uh, I think you just need to be patient and that's kind of your job as a developer, right? If you're working for Apple platforms, you kind of stuck with what you have. You can try to go like with React Native, but that's like a opening a whole another can of worms. Uh, so I'm a, actually, I'm happy with their software releases recently. iOS has been really stable. Mac OS is really stable for, for me. I rely on iCloud key uh, stuff. Uh, daily, you know, I use Xcode. I think it's it's really fine. And Xcode, it's a really massive project at this point. They have so many different tools, and uh, you know, we just take it for granted now. Uh, but there's really a lot in this app, so I can see how if it you know if it crashes sometimes, <laughs> it's always been crashing, right? You know, I've been working for ten years like uh, on iOS apps. It's been like that all the time. <laughs> Oh yeah, and uh, uh, source kit uh, stops uh, like for 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 no reason. I f I see that much less now actually. So I probably would agree yeah. that quality I think it's is actually getting better. a little it bit. It is better. getting better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's that's, that's why sure. they open sourced it. I I believe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, should we like cover one more framework? <laughs> which is oh, yeah. probably again something of quality pretty good maybe yeah yeah so uh in your last project pause you started using swift ui heavily like a lot of swift ui yeah. so what do you think about it is it ready for production actually it's my favorite topic about swift ui <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 that's so <laughs> <terrible>. yeah <laughs> yeah 
Uh, I think, yeah, both. Some people say, I think it's probably one of the first projects, or at least the first project that they saw that uses Swift UI in this way, like not just like a web app, but in an entire suite of apps for all Apple platforms, right? Um, well, I can't name any other <laughs> apps really. <laughs> uh, yeah, in my experience, I think it is ready for production in a sense that if you use it correctly, which is sometimes hard, it won't crash in production, <laughs> at least too often. <laughs> Uh, yeah, glowing endorsement. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, but it's like different. It's for every platform is a little bit different. Yeah. And yeah. during the development of uh, Pulse, how many times did you start thinking, why did I start using Swift UI? I can rewrite this form on native <laughs> uh, frameworks for, uh, like, like this. So how many times? Uh, well, at least a few, yeah, because, you know, you encounter some issue or something that you can't do, and then you think, man, I really should have just used NS window and <laughs> NS toolbar and then, or NS table view. And, uh, you know, but then at this point, it's just so much, it's just so big of an investment that you can't really do it. And so you have to find ways around it somehow. Yeah, so some some versions I've written for in uh, native frameworks. Fortunately, you, have, you can combine, you know, you can mix and match. So I use an S table view, and it's fine. It's just a sub view in your app. Everything else is Swift UI, and it works nicely. And uh, you're already mentioning the macOS. Um, can you compare from your just your pure personal experience? Uh, like, what's the state of Swift UI for the iOS, for the macOS, for the probably tvOS? Like, I is it the same on all platforms, or you see that some platforms get, let's say, more attention from Apple, or like more bug fixing, or yeah. more feature uh, availability? Yeah, I think pretty clear. It's it's definitely ready on WatchOS because that's where it originated from. So you can build anything that you want in watch on WatchOS with Swift UI, and it works really nicely. And it is, of course, on iOS. It's also great on tvOS. I don't know really because <laughs> I just compiled my iOS code base. It kind of worked. I did a little bit for tvOS, and it worked. So hey, but. I I can't really tell if it's, you know, how good is it? It, it, it works there. Yeah. But Mac OS could cool, cool uh, it just, you know, Mac OS is just very different. These you, you can, I think you can write a, uh, an app that would look like a, an iPad app, you know, like, like three column navigation, like the like typical iPad app just to just not using catalyst, but using Swift UI natively, you can do it and it will look great and it works great but, but i don't think that you can write a professional app uh, like an xcode or that you'll ever will i don't know if you'll ever will be able to uh but i really enjoy using it i think it's the main reason i was able to tackle all of the firms at once so you you know you learn it once you apply it everywhere like similar to react and react native in a sense and also similar to react native i don't actually reuse almost any of the UI code between platforms because the UI um, is different. The navigation is different. So I, I don't reuse any of the code. And actually, uh, when they announced the Swift UI, they basically said that the Swift UI concept is not write once, use everywhere, but mm -hmm. rather understand once and uh, write code in the same approach everywhere. So it's not to reuse the whole things. and. Uh, uh, the the concept is to be reused and we have a question but before we will ask the question from the audience again um i have one more so you mentioned catalyst and you mentioned swift ui and they are basically like again both ways of let's put it like clearly it's a way of moving your existing probably like existing or developing up from the i don't know, I don't know ipad or even from the iphone to the mac um you will probably not be starting the new app on the Mac if it's just a Mac app in Catalyst. <laughs> or or will you, by the way? 
So what yeah, do you think about this? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. How how do you how do you measure like are, are these efforts uh, like helping the Mac or uh, like I don't know what, what's your opinion on Catalyst and like the whole thing of migrating your uh, iPad apps to the Mac? Uh, well, I think all apps are great as long as they solve the problem for users. They have acceptable performance and. Uh, really care what the apps are written with. I use personally, I use all different apps. I use stuff in the browser. I use professional apps written using kid. Uh, I don't really care as long as it solves the problem and it works for people. It's great. And I think Catalyst has been, uh, has been good for the platform because we got some apps like, I don't know, like stocks or whatever. Right. Uh, <laughs> and Swift UI is also going to be, uh, good for the platform obviously oh yeah twitter like that's a good example right they they brought their app oh, yeah. uh using catalyst and that's actually like quite a good example i mean like uh, i recently rechecked their app and it's well it's not the best native experience but it works nice i mean like nice enough to to be to be using the app instead of a uh, browser we have a couple more questions. And uh, so the first question again from Maxim, uh, what technologies from your opinion are not popular now, but will be popular in, I don't know, like one or two years? Do you think of something? Uh, I think it's probably thinking about, about uh, Kotlin multi-platform. <laughs> That's what I hear about, a lot <laughs> about. Uh, I, I, I try to invest some time to learn it. Uh, for me, it was just too challenging. Uh, there are so many things that just, you know, it works for Android nicely. And that's why they love it. <laughs> because it, for them, it's just Kotlin and the Kotlin frameworks, it works nicely. But it's such a pain in the ass. Uh, if you want to make an iOS to use it, I don't think it's worth the investment. Uh, maybe if you were right, there are some um, examples, like um, use cases, like I think Yandex Disk uses it. And app like that, it's probably a better tool than C++, right? Than sharing C++ code. But it's a very special case. And I don't think it's going to be needed for most apps. Uh, but other than that, I don't know. I think uh, we have it good with Swift and Swift UI. It's getting better every year. So for Apple platforms, I think it's definitely going to be Swift UI uh, in the future. What do you think about AR as a like as a technology in a whole? It's not mm. yet like everywhere, but yeah. like if Apple releases glasses, will it catch up? Mm. And probably when uh, Apple yeah, releases glasses. VR, yeah. VR has been around for how long? Like seven years maybe? Uh yeah. I Pretty used nice. it once. Yeah. Yeah. I used it once. I don't know. I don't need it for anything really. Uh I don't know if uh, it's going to be the same sort of revolution as an iPhone was. Um, maybe it will be. We don't know. Like, if you can have a computer in your eye, <laughs> you know, yeah, you probably won't need an iPhone. Uh, but for glasses, we'll have to see. Like, it can be big or maybe it will be nothing. Or it will be niche. Yeah. yeah. Um, another question. Uh, and this one is... Uh... Probably you might have an answer here because you're using GitHub and uh, they have Copilot. Uh, so how far are we from AI writing the code? And uh, like, I don't know, did you try Copilot on uh, no. Swift? <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I didn't like, try. Probably it. not yet, right? <laughs> but do you think like yeah. basically will AI help us or like will be any automation or like something like will be done by by uh, computer by itself? Yeah, I think it's absolutely will. I haven't tried it, but I really should. I know that even like uh, writers, you know, write books, right? They use AI as assistants and it, it just comes up with all different variations and they, they just speak what they like and modify it. Uh, so yeah, I think why not? Uh, if I, programming is very, you know, uh, a lot of apps like are very similar 
UIs and uh, some business logic can also be similar. Some approaches can be similar. So if it suggests you like a block of code and then you just slightly modify it to your needs, it's and it's if it's faster than typing it yourself manually. Yeah, I think it's going to be a great uh, addition. Well, the app is not going to write itself though. <laughs> that's I don't know, that's never going to be a, a thing. Yeah, some kind of probably <laughs> network layer. So I have a request, get request to this URL with these parameters, just write this code. We, we have all and these actually... swaggers and so on, but doing uh, having this inside uh, ID, it would be really cool. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It's, it, it seems that you are like describing some low code or no code platforms, which uh, like basically they are mostly doing that. So you drag something together and you get a form and the form like is rendered like even in native UI and something like that. But that's still not like doing by itself. And it's rather like you have some predefined components for some predefined actions. Like that's, 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 we, we already have that on, on the market, but like more sophisticated tools. Yeah. I don't think that will be available like really soon mm -hmm. maybe like sometime into the future i think that it's because yeah, we don't have been. a huge huge bunch of uh open source swift code to oh. uh, to 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 learn this uh, system yeah yeah you know we've always been going like higher and higher in terms of level of abstraction uh i don't see if we can go any higher in like at swift it has so many features already it's hard to learn uh, all of it, and you don't really need to. Uh, I think it's just a natural next step. Like, how do we push? Uh, how do we make it even like uh, higher level? Yeah, yeah. And uh, speaking of this copilot and uh, like machine learning from open source, the only thing I hope is that it will learn from the good projects, <laughs> because. <laughs> That's probably the, the important part to be learning from the projects which uh, use good practices, good, I don't know, architectures, good uh, solution decisions made by the authors, rather than be learning from, I don't know, test project, which you do as an exam for some course and like you are, was just learning something. I think which that's probably the problem most of the with. projects on GitHub. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. I think uh, we have one more question to you. And it's more like a very open question, actually. So what would you say to indie developers thinking about small or big projects for themselves? Uh, oh, just absolutely like, go for it. Uh, you know, you don't, you only need a computer to start. Uh, so you can build anything you want. And when you realize that you can build tools that other people can use it, you know, just fantastic experience. And you now it can be like anything like a small projects, if you just want it for a commercial professional growth, and you, know, you want to add a new technology to your resume. Uh, I can be a big commercial project, but maybe check with your current work first, if that's okay with them. <laughs> or to make sure that don't uh, ask the rights for the project. Uh, yeah, I don't have any experience with commercial software, so don't take advice from uh, that. But if you want to con contribute to open source, I think it's a no brainer. If you have time, just, yeah, it's a really uh, great experience and be beneficial. Uh, I heard once idea that uh, you can start contributing into uh, open source just by writing unit tests for existing projects. That would help a lot. Yeah, yeah. And that's our, easy to start with. Yeah, you can start with documentation or unit tests, uh, but again, nobody uh, forces you like to contribute to some existing project. If you want to learn something new and you have a lot of, you know, uh, you want to just build the whole thing yourself and learn a lot. I think you can just start and build something for yourself. And that's one way to uh, start uh, easily, let's say, because I think it can be 
be some people recommend uh, that in the beginning of your career you just go and contribute to some big project like linux or whatever right i don't think that's happening like the the, the projects are really complicated and it's not as easy as it sounds uh, uh, and can be intimidating. So, uh, but again, you can always start small and you can start with your project where you have full control and nobody going to close your pull request because it doesn't satisfy these standards or wherever. True. I think uh, that's it for today. And uh, Alex, thank you for coming. That was a really inspirational and really interesting discussion. Uh, personally, and I think like our uh, listeners and viewers will uh, uh, agree with me here. Like, good luck with your projects. We hope to see something new from you. We'll probably new projects, new releases, uh, new versions of of the existing uh, frameworks or apps. Maybe conference talks. By the way, like you probably have a lot of experience to share um, to the guys. And uh, thanks for coming and. Uh, for all of you who are listening and watching, we will be back uh, in two weeks with new guests and new topics to discuss. Thanks. Yep. Thank Thanks. You guys. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you, Alex. Bye. Thanks for listening. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Goodbye.